Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good morning. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. New book today, we're going to do the Gospel of Luke. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, Luke is called the beloved physician. And he was, he was a medical doctor. And throughout the Gospel of Luke, he's going to use many medical terms, even like the gulf in Luke chapter 16, that's a medical term. And Luke was also the writer of the Acts, the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. And you have many similarities in the way that it's written, such as medical terms. And Luke, think about how helpful it must have been when Luke was with Paul, when they were shipwrecked often, when Paul was beaten and through the hardships he went through, that God made sure that Paul had a doctor with him right there. God always provides and of course, as we'll learn in the gospel about the true physician, the one who not only has the power to heal physically, but has the power to heal our soul, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that one who came in the flesh and died on the cross and resurrected and defeated death for us so that all who believe on him could have eternal life. So let's get into Luke. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, and in this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you, and we love you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. So, all right, we're picking up Luke chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads... For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. And Luke is going to be very precise, going to set everything in order, going to tell us exactly as it all went down. Verse 2, and how it says are most surely believed, meaning to completely give us assurance and to prove what is true. Verse 2, even as they deliver them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. And he's saying, because I have this exact understanding, I'm going to bring it to you exactly as it went down. And that Theopolis, that word is only used in one other place, and it's Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Once again, connecting the writings of Luke. And Theopolis, if it was to be translated, means friend of God. And you find out in John chapter 15, verse 14, all, all you got to do to be the friend of Jesus Christ is to do whatsoever He commands, and you are even considered a friend to Him. Verse 4. That thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Once again, the certainty, the precision of this gospel is very, very exact. Verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they are going to be the parents of John the Baptist. So not only was his father of the Levitical line, the priest line, but his mother was also. Now, this course of Abiah, that gives us a date. You learn about, you can read about this in 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 14, and as well as 1 Chronicles chapter 24, that there were 24 courses that... Um, there would be, the, and the course of Abiah is the eighth course. So that gives us a date, and it gives us one of two dates that the course of Abiah would take place. And those dates are December the 6th, or yes, December 6th through December 12th, and June 13th through June 19th. And as we go along in the first two chapters of Luke, we're going to see that the events that we're about to read, Zacharias was performing his duty as a priest during the course that would be June 13th to June 19th. 
And of course, what would just be a one week period, you'd have people that you'd have a certain group of priests that go one week. And then when that week was over, you'd go to the second week. And the course of Abiah, that's the eighth course. And you can find that in 1 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 10. So once again, that date, June 13th through 19th, that's very important for what we're about to read. Let's go to the next verse, verse 6. And they were both righteous before God, speaking of Zacharias and Elizabeth, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. They followed God's word to the letter, as we should all give our very best effort to do so. Verse 7, we all sin, so don't get on a guilt trip, but we should all do our very best to serve God exactly to the letter. Verse 7, and they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. They would have been beyond past the point that most would think was possible to have a child. But as we're going to see in this chapter, nothing is impossible with God. And there would be quite a few women who were barren that a very circumstantial thing would take place that God would give them a child. Samson's mother was barren. You see in Judges chapter 13, Samuel's mother was barren. Of course, at first, then God opened her womb. Samuel's mother in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And also um, Abraham and his wife Sarah. Sarah was barren. But then God would open her womb and she would bring forth Isaac. And through Isaac would the seed be called and would through that seed line would be born our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 8. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, once again, that's June 13th through June 19th, verse 9, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. That, that was his job. Verse 10, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, that means while he was inside the temple, there was people outside the temple, and they, they were praying also. Verse 11, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. That might remind you of Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. Now we're going to find when we get to verse 19 that this angel is Gabriel. And that we're going to read about in the book of Luke. I can't say for sure that the angel in Revelation chapter 8 verse 3 is Gabriel, but I think that's a very good possibility. Verse 12, And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. I mean, when an angel from God appears, I mean, that's going to be a significant thing. Verse 13, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, you never have anything to fear when you're doing things God's way anyway. For thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And John means Yahweh is gracious, or Yahweh is giving. And um, once again, this would be John the Baptist. Verse 14, And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And that would, so apparently that he was to be under the vow of a Nazarite, which that was one of the things, as you read in Numbers chapter 6, that they were not to drink any wine, not even to eat any grapes. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, that's the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Verse 16, and of course, as we're going to see in this chapter, life does begin at conception. You can also remember in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, how Jeremiah was chosen before he was even in his mother's womb. And when he was in the womb, he was ordained a prophet. Verse 16, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, that's Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We're going to find out that John the Baptist was going to be born six months before Jesus Christ. So he's the forerunner. He was prophesied of back in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. 
and he would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. John the Baptist is not Elijah. They would ask him in John chapter 1, verse 21, I believe it is, they asked John the Baptist, are you Elijah? And he says, no. So don't ever let anyone tell you that John the Baptist is Elijah. And it will tell you in Matthew chapter 11, about verse 11, that if he was accepted, then this would be Elijah. But of course, he was not accepted. He was, John the Baptist was beheaded. But he did come in that spirit and power of Elijah. Verse 18, and I will say that just as John the Baptist, how he was the forerunner for the first advent of Jesus Christ, as you see in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, that before Jesus Christ returns at the second advent, Elijah will come. Verse 18, and Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. Now, Zacharias is doubting. And when you get a message from an angel of God, you better never doubt. And you better never doubt anything that's written in God's word. But Zacharias is going to doubt and he's going to pay for it. Verse 19, And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that being translated as man of God, that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. Verse 20, and behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Always everything comes to pass exactly as God perfectly plans it. So don't doubt God. I mean, Zacharias, God made it so he couldn't speak. So Big consequences could happen if you, don't put, if you don't put your faith and belief in the words of God. You better never doubt God's words. Verse 21, And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. I mean, they're saying, what's going on with this guy in there? He's been in there so long. 22, And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. When it says he beckoned unto them, it means he was, he was using his hands, trying to signal to them, trying to communicate with them. Because God shut his mouth that he couldn't speak. Verse 23. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. So that time from June 13th to June 19th, his time in the, to serve as a priest was finished. So now he heads home beginning on June 20th, and it would take him probably about two or three days to get home. So he's going to get home approximately June 22nd. Verse 24. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying... And so he got home approximately 23rd. That, that day or the next day approximately, they would conceive John the Baptist. So once again, we're on approximately June 23rd, June 24th here. When you see five months, that always perks up your mind. And Verse 25, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me, to take away my reproach among men. And it was thought as people, if someone saw a woman was barren, that, they, that was like a shameful thing at that time. And you can see that even in Genesis chapter 30. And when God opened Rachel's womb and Joseph would be born, one of the patriarchs, he would say, thank the Lord my reproach is taken away from among men. So Elizabeth giving glory and the praise to God, as we always should, giving God the credit. Verse 26. And the sixth month, so now we, 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 go, we go one month ahead now. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And so now, we, so now we're six months from approximately June 24th taking us to approximately December 25th. And what we're about to see is that approximately December 25th is going to be the day that Jesus Christ began dwelling in Mary's womb. Not the day that he was born, 
but the day that he began to be in the womb. And of course, that would be when the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Like it says in John chapter 1, verse 14, Christ would be placed in Mary's womb on approximately December 25th. And that's the day that we come to here. So I'll read verse 26 again. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Verse 27. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. That means he's of the tribe of Judah. And the virgin's name was Mary. And remember, this was prophesied back in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. A virgin shall be with child and conceive and be with child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, what does Emmanuel mean being translated? It means God with us. And of course, Jesus Christ is God. And once again, I'll mention John chapter 1. In verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, John chapter 1, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Verse 28, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, that, that, that's a greeting, be well is what it means. Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And I would say so. I would say so. She's the mother of the living God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 29. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. She's trying to figure out what's exactly going on here, that this angel coming and speaking to her, this angel... Verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. Once again, you never have to fear when you're doing things God's way. For thou hast found favor with God. Verse 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And you can read about in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, speaking about how Jesus would be born. And it says there that he shall save his people from their sins. And Christ does. He paid that price on the cross for us. That one who had no sin paid the price for all of our sins. And like it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, when you confess your sins, God is faithful to cleanse us of all unrighteousness that's only possible through the blood of Jesus Christ. And what does Jesus mean being translated? Yahweh's Savior. And He is the Savior. God came in the flesh as the Son and paid that price for our sins. Verse 32. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto Him the throne of His father David. And that throne is an everlasting throne. And that was even prophesied of in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13, where God was giving prophecy. It was God speaking to David. How even it was speaking also even of his David's son Solomon who would take the throne, but the the bigger the uh, the ultimate prophecy of that was that through the loins of David all the way down to to Mary would come the Savior, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, who would sit on that throne forever and ever. Verse thirty three, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And this, is all, this was also written of in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Where in, in, chap, in chapter 9, verse 6 of Isaiah, it says, A child shall be born, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Everlasting Father, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace. And so that is, if you ever have any doubt that Jesus Christ is God, I mean, it's documented over and over and over. Understand, that's how much God loves us, that He came in the flesh. He, did, he, he came in the flesh. He didn't say, oh, you guys all have to go through the flesh, but I'm not going to. No, He came in the flesh. And because He went through all these things in the flesh, He knows exactly how to get us through the hard times. As you can see in the last few verses of Hebrews chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 4. We should never stop being grateful. We should never stop thanking God for that. Verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? 
verse, and she's not doubting notice because God knows the hearts. God knew in Zechariah's heart that he was doubting. But Mary's not doubting. She's just trying to figure out, well, how is this going to happen? Verse 35. And the angel said unto her, The Holy Ghost, that's the Holy Spirit, shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now that overshadow is a very interesting word in the Greek. It means to, uh, to uh, just uh, envelope with, with brilliance. And it's only used in three situations. It's used here. It's also used in Acts chapter 5, verse 15, where people were seeing the miracles that God was performing through Peter and the apostles. And they would, they would just take the sick and the diseased out in the street, just hoping that, Peter, that, hoping that Peter's shadow would overshadow them. And that's that word overshadowed. Because God was performing incredible healings and miracles. But don't ever forget to give God the credit. You don't give Peter and the apostles the credit, the credit, but you give God the credit. The, so there was that. And then there was also the situation that's written of in three different times in the Gospels. At when um, Jesus Christ was transfigured and Moses and Elijah both appeared with Jesus Christ on that Mount of Transfiguration. And the, the Heavenly Father spoke, and, and that word overshadowed is used there, that brilliance. And it says, um, uh, but Behold my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. And of course, we better hearken to the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 36, and one of those places you can read about that, you can read about the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, and then I believe we're going to get to it in Luke chapter 9. And it's also in Mark somewhere. Verse 36, and behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And you can even read about it in Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13, how Jesus Christ is that King of kings and He is a priest who sits on that throne. And so remember, June 13th through 19th, Zechariah was performing the course of Abiah. It took him a few days to get home and conceive. The John the Baptist, so six months later, we come to approximately December 25th. That's the date that we're at here. Verse 37, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And don't you ever forget that verse. Verse 38, and Mary said, behold, the handmaid, that means she, she's being humble, saying how she is God's servant. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And that's once again how we should all be. It even tells us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, when you ask for our Heavenly Father for something in prayer, you ask that it be in God's will. God's plan is perfect. He is all-knowing. He is all-seeing. We put our trust completely in Him. And the angel departed from her. Verse 39, And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. When Mary even came in the vicinity of Elizabeth, John the Baptist, who was in Elizabeth's womb, he leaped in the womb because he felt the presence of the Holy Spirit because Jesus Christ had been placed in Mary's womb. And he leaped with joy. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. So once again, don't ever let someone try to tell you that life doesn't begin at conception. Absolutely does. It's documented over and over. Verse 42. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. I mean, nothing could be more obvious the Son of God began dwelling in Mary on December 20, in Mary on December 25th. Verse 43. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come unto me? Saying, how am I even beginning to be worthy that I should be in the presence of the mother of the Son of God? Verse 44. 
For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. John the Baptist leaped in the womb. He felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we can feel the, whole, the presence of the Holy Spirit dwelling with us as well. Those of you that believe on Jesus Christ. Something that people who don't believe just don't understand. But it's so easy to know that God is real and He is with you. Because you feel the warmth and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Verse 45 to complete. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. So do you believe what the Word of God says? It's always going to be performed exactly as it is written. And blessed are those that believe. When, when we get into chapter 2, we'll come across some things that make it very clear, once again, that Jesus Christ was not born in December. But he was, Jesus Christ was placed in Mary's womb on December 25th. And he would be born on approximately September 29th, which is also very, very interesting because that's the Feast of Tabernacles. And even when Solomon would give the dedication to the temple, when the temple would be built in um, 1 Kings chapter 8, that was at the Feast of Tabernacles, when that new temple would come forth. And then Jesus Christ being born on that Feast of Tabernacles. When he made it to where God doesn't dwell in a temple made with hands. But you can be anywhere in the world at any time. And you can be a part of that many-membered body of Christ. And you can serve in that temple. Because once again, it's not a temple that's made with hands. But it is that many-membered body of Christ. And the Feast of Tabernacles is all about how God protected the Israelites when he brought them out of captivity. And Jesus Christ looses us of the shackles. He sets you free from your sin when you repent. Because of that price that he paid on the cross. And he resurrected defeating death. We should never ever take that for granted. We should always remember to give God the glory and thank him for that. And like it says in Romans chapter 10 verse 9. It says, those who believe on the Savior Jesus Christ and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved if you are willing to profess that. If you are willing to be proud to say that you're a Christian. And truly, there's no greater blessing in this world than to have eternal life through believing on the Savior Jesus Christ. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending your only begotten Son to die on the cross and resurrect for us, Father. We thank you for, for your forgiveness and your love and for this gospel and for your whole word. And We just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share it with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. This was recorded in the year 2022 at Smyrna Christian Church, Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.